land on Plymouth Rock, Plymouth Rock landed on us. You know you're watching a Spike Lee film if, first of all, it's not a film, it's a joint. The story is often set in Brooklyn. Lee's given us many odes to the borough he grew up in. You think I'm talking Brooklynese? He celebrates its vibrant culture, communities, and way of life. But the Brooklyn that Lee loves is largely a thing of the past. Yo, what you want to live in a black neighborhood for anyway, man? Mother f gentrification. Well the director has been outspoken against gentrification taking over Brooklyn neighborhoods like Fort Greene and Bed-Stuy. When you move into a neighborhood, have some respect for the history, mm. for the culture. In the She's Gotta Have It reboot, he deals with this issue head on. My stoop has been defaced two times with this G for gentrification, which is reverse racism. And the series opening credits mix new images of Fort Greene with images from the original movie to make us viscerally feel how much has changed in that neighborhood. Before we go on, we want to tell you a little bit about this video sponsor. Mubi is a curated film streaming service with a twist. You get 30 films per month, a new film every day. It's a hand-picked selection of movie gems from around the world. We're huge fans of Mubi at Screen Prism, so click the link in our description below to get a full month of Mubi for free. The character's first moment on screen tells you who they are. Lee introduces his characters to the audience with a symbolic image or action that reveals the person's identity. Use it. <laughs> Peace, In the original She's Gotta Have It, we see movement under the covers of a bed and we think there's a couple under there, but then Nola sits up and it's just her. That tells us she's an independent woman who can't be happy with just one romantic partner. And introducing her in bed signals how her sexuality is fundamental to who she is. My body, my mind. Who is gonna own it, them or me? I am not a one-man woman. During the opening credits of Malcolm X, we hear the title character giving a speech. I charge the white man with being the greatest murderer on earth. I charge the white man with being the greatest kidnapper on earth. But we don't actually see Malcolm X in this scene. When he first appears, it's as a younger man. So the film first prepares us to meet an icon. Well, let us hear from our minister, Minister Malcolm X. Let us bring him on with a round of applause. And instead introduces the person he was pre-fame to explore how this legend came to be. The story has a heightened idiosyncratic tone. Lee often tackles serious issues, but in an offbeat, irreverent, sometimes outrageous way with a lot of personality. Pick a nanny, Barbie doll, high yellow heifer, tar baby, wanna be white, jigaboo. In Black Klansman, a black detective is on a mission to infiltrate the KKK, but through Lee's lens, this premise becomes comedic. My mouth to God's ears, I really hate those black rats. And anyone else, really, that doesn't have pure white Aryan blood running through their veins. I'm happy to be talking to a true white American. Chirac is about the gang violence that turns Chicago's South Side into a war zone, but Lee approaches this through the playful story of women organizing a sex strike. We force our men to negotiate peace by exercising cocksure self-control and total abstinence from knocking the boots. Oh! We see vibrant colors. Many of Lee's films use bright, bold tones. In Do the Right Thing, the warm color palette visually represents the summer heat wave. In Chirac, the rival gang's colors of purple and orange are integrated into the cinematography, as if this conflict is part of the environment itself. And Crooklyn has vivid primary colors, as if we're seeing the world through the child protagonist's eyes. The characters appear to glide, thanks to Lee's trademark double dolly shot. This shot puts both the actor and the camera on a dolly, so it looks like characters are being propelled forward by a force of nature or having an out-of-body experience. In Malcolm X, the double dolly shot is used as Malcolm heads to the speech where he'll be assassinated. He seems to float along like a ghost, so this is a visual foreshadowing of his imminent death. In Inside Man and 25th Hour, the shot reflects a disoriented state of mind, a detective's shock after he thinks he's seen a hostage executed, and a high school teacher's turmoil after kissing his student. The camera is brash and bold, giving us unconventional angles. And do the right thing, the Dutch angles mirror the instability of the neighborhood, where racial tensions are threatening to boil over. Lee uses these creative angles as an expression of the moment. 
It's a way of adding an energy and individuality in where the camera is. And the mix of surprising, provocative angles in his films makes us feel like we're part of this world rather than observing it from a remove. The characters have a stylized, playful way of talking. They might riff on repetitions please, baby, please, baby, please, baby, 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 please. or reverse the order of phrases. Here I am. Am I here? You know it. It, you know. And she's got to have it. Mars has a way of making the conversation go in circles. No, are you up? Yes, I'm up. You awake? I'm awake. You up? I'm up, Mars. Can I ask you a question? Yeah, go on. It's okay? It's okay. In Chirac, the characters often speak in rhyme, just like in the story's inspiration, the Greek play Lysistrata. It looked like an invasion, not a persuasion. All this for some unarmed women of color? I think something got lost in translation. So Lee creates both a distinctive visual and spoken language in his films. We want our men alive. We want our babies to thrive. We gonna have to organize. It teaches you about film history. Lee is a lifelong cinephile. I'm a cinephile. A cine what? A cinephile, a film enthusiast. His films have always been informed by a love of cinema, and they're packed with cinematic illusions. You look like Kim Novak from what movie? Vertigo. Vertigo, baby. In Do the Right Thing, Radio Rahim's love and hate speech is an update to a scene in The Night of the Hunter. Now watch, and I'll show you the story of life. The story of life is this. Static. The opening credit sequence is inspired by the opening of Bye Bye Birdie. Sometimes, Lee even references his own movies. Denzel did the damn thing. And got robbed of that Academy Award. But these references don't have an above-your-head pretentious feeling. A lot of the time, he's pointing them out for us, breaking down what they mean. He told Mary that he was out on a work release program or something. A man escaped just like Shawshank. Clint Eastwood and escaped from Alcatraz, the fugitive. Lee is now a film professor at NYU and it almost feels like he's teaching a film class explicitly through his films, too. In the She's Gotta Have It reboot, Nola even pauses to give us a primer on Akira Kurosawa's Rashomon. That film came out in 1951, shot in beautiful black and white photography. It's about a rape, a murder, and several witnesses who all saw the same crime, but from entirely different viewpoints. Whether you have a film education or not, this context helps you understand more about what you're seeing, since She's Gotta Have It was inspired by Rashomon's technique of telling a story from conflicting points of view. If it's an earlier movie, Spike Lee might be in the cast. In addition to Mookie and Do the Right Thing, he's probably most associated with the Mars Blackman persona that he originated in She's Gotta Have It. Do you know how I get up for my game? Do you know, do you know, do you know? That's right, Air Jordan, Air Jordan, Air Jordan. The story gives us a nuanced look at race in America. Because you're Jewish, brother. The so-called chosen people. You've been passing for a wasp. That's what some light-skinned black folks do. They pass for white. Lee is not just giving us a simplified story about race that's what we've seen before. He's looking at how race issues manifest in deeply complex ways, like colorism. Well, I guess I just wasn't light enough for you, was I, Flipper? And hair politics. Don't you wish you had hair like this? Then the boys again. He explores highly specific phenomenons like a racist white person who's obsessed with black culture. All you ever talk about is it is that. And all your favorite people are so called It's different. Magic, Eddie Prince. I'm not I mean, you're not black. I mean. Or a biracial person who hates the white part of their identity. One of the reasons she married my father was because he was so black. She hated her complexion, the white blood in her body, and she wanted her children to have some color. The story explores the politics of desire. Because so many of our sisters have been raped or violated by the white man, the black man can't wait to get their hands on the white man's pride. The white woman. Lee is interested in gender politics and the way that race and class dynamics enter into our romantic lives. I've often wondered if the only reason you're with me is because I'm one of the darkest sisters on campus. In Jungle Fever, a married black man starts a relationship with his white secretary, and this is seen as a betrayal of his community. We've got a big problem, you and her. The both of you's got the fever. The what? The fever. The both of you's got jungle fever. And in She's Gotta Have It, the men in Nola's life can't understand or accept that she doesn't want to settle down into a monogamous relationship because this is so far from their assumptions about female desires. I think you're sick. Now, I'm not saying that you're a nympho, slut, or a whore, but maybe a sex addict. The film has documentary footage in it. Lee's documentaries are some of his most critically acclaimed films. 
and even his narrative films often have some documentary or archival footage element, like the footage of Rodney King during the opening credits of Malcolm X, the images of black history at the beginning of school days, and the photo of Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X in Do the Right Thing. This technique is a way of reminding us how much the past informs the present, and it shows that Lee's interest is always in the real world. He doesn't want his narrative films to be some removed fiction. He's trying to show viewers their own society. The film breaks the action for an interlude. This might be to deliver a larger commentary, like the race rant montage in Do the Right Thing. Dago Wab, Ganny, Garlic Bread, Pizza Sling, and Spaghetti Ben, and Vic Damone, Perry Como, Luciano Pavarotti, Solo Meal, Non Singer, Mother. Other times it's more about stopping to enjoy the beauty or energy of a scene. The dance performance in She's Gotta Have It breaks the action visually because it's a color sequence in an otherwise black and white film. Jolting the viewers out of the story they've been following is Lee's way of drawing our attention to the pleasures of cinema and what it can do. Because for him, filmmaking isn't always about a linear plotline. It's about creative surprises and expressing his ideas in innovative ways. Characters break the fourth wall and talk right to us. Man, are you still talking then about Noah Darling? Uh-huh. Yeah? Yeah. You sure? Let me say a couple things to them, okay? Even when characters don't address us directly, they often look into the camera so they seem to be staring at us. Lee's not trying to create a comfortable cinematic experience where you go home satisfied and forget about what you just saw. He wants to provoke and confront us. The Wall Street Brokers, self-styled masters of the universe, send those Enron assholes to jail for f life. We can compare Lee's filmmaking to the epic theater of dramatist Bertolt Brecht. Brecht wanted his audience to be aware that they were watching a play, because he thought this would encourage them to adopt a more critical perspective and enact change. Likewise, a Spike Lee joint reminds you you're watching a movie, and it's speaking to you about your world, issuing a call to action. The only real security is love, y'all. L-O-V-E. Let's all together make Chirac back into Chicago. The film tells you to. Someone says these words in almost all of Lee's movies. Wake up! Wake up! Wake up! Wake up, wake up, wake up! Up you wake, up you wake, up you wake, up you wake! This simple command is really the fundamental message of a Spike Lee joint. Wake up, wake up, wake up, wake up, wake up, wake up! The director is telling us to shake ourselves out of complacency. Why are you acting like you ain't got skin in the game, bro? Confront difficult realities and take action to solve the problems facing our society by any means necessary. I has only played the platters that matter, the matters they platter, and that's the truth. Root. Hi guys, this is Alani, the newest member of the Screen Prism team. And today I want to talk to you about one of our favorite places to watch movies, Mubi. Mubi is a treasure trove of films from around the globe. Every day a new film is added and the oldest is taken away. So in this world where it's very easy to spend hours debating what you should watch, Mubi is like having a really cool friend with amazing taste in movies, making it so much easier for you. They feature hard to come by masterpieces, indie festival darlings, influential art house and foreign films, lesser known films by your favorite famous directors and more. Plus you can even download the films to watch offline and there are no ads ever. One film you can watch right now on Mubi is Family Life. It's directed by Ken Loach, a top British filmmaker we love who's known for movies like Kess and, most recently, I, Daniel Blake. Family life is the story of a rebellious teenager who clashes with her strict parents. Point is, we can't recommend Mubi highly enough. You can try it out for free for a whole month. Just click the link in the description below.